Isaiah 13, I'll read the first eight verses. The oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. On a bare hill, raise a signal, cry aloud to them, wave the hand for them to enter, the gates of the nobles. I myself have commanded my consecrated ones and have summoned my mighty men to execute my anger, my proudly exulting ones. The sound of a tumult is on the mountains, as of a great multitude. The sound of an uproar of kingdoms, of nations gathering together. The Lord of hosts is mustering a host for battle. They come from a distant land, from the end of the heavens. The Lord and the weapons of his indignation to destroy the whole land. Wait, for the day of the Lord is near. As destruction from the Almighty, it will come. Therefore, all hands will be feeble and every human heart will melt. They will be dismayed. Pangs and agony will seize them. They will be in anguish like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at one another. Their faces will be all aflame. I'll just read to verse 10, actually. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. For the stars of the heavens and their consolations will not give their light. The sun will be dark at its rising and the moon will not shed its light. I just wanted to read that last verse. We'll talk about it in a moment, but you can see the connection uh, with what Jesus says in uh, Mark 13 and uh, the the parallel passages. Uh, Well, with this chapter, we uh, enter a new section of Jeremiah that goes through, Jeremiah, Isaiah, uh, that goes through to uh, chapter 27. And uh, here, uh, the the first 12, um, uh, 12 chapters were very much addressed to Judah uh, to uh, call her to trust the Lord and not to trust the nations uh, around. And that, in a sense, is still the theme. But here it's not Assyria, who was the kind of dominant nation in the first uh, 12 chapters, fades to the background. And here it's other nations like Babylon uh, that come uh, to the fore. Uh, Other nations uh, that they were tempted to trust in. And um, it's interesting, uh, you know, I've always kind of thought about these chapters in in the Bible. So here's a chapter addressed to the ancient nation of uh, Babylon. So how do I, as a Christian reader, uh, you know, how how am I supposed to read this as as scripture when it's uh, it really is not addressed to me? No, that's the same question. When I read the the letter of the, you know, the Corinthians, in one sense, it's not addressed uh, to me. Paul's not writing to me directly, but I'm a Christian. You know, they're Christians. We can, uh, you know, we we share so much in common. So I can uh, hear that letter. And obviously there'll be some specific things, you know, greetings to specific people at the church in Corinth that I don't necessarily uh, take uh, uh, directly to myself. But what about this? It's a chapter, in a sense, written to... um, an, an ancient nation uh, that doesn't really even exist anymore. Babylon is, is modern day Iraq, but it's not the same nation. Well, when we think about it, this prophecy that Isaiah delivers wasn't really for uh, Babylon in one sense. It wasn't um, uh, spoken. Isaiah didn't speak it to the people of Babylon as much as he spoke it about Babylon for the people of Israel to hear. People of Israel, Judah, who were tempted to trust in this nation, you, you're tempted to trust in this nation. Well, let's just listen to what, what God says to this nation. And when you hear what God says to this nation, well, then you won't be tempted to, uh, to trust in them. And what God says to this nation is he uh, talks about using them for his um, purposes, but then calls them to account. So uh, here is, we'll see, an example of kind of sinful arrogance and uh, once we start to see that, then we can see, okay, uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a pagan uh, Near Eastern uh, ancient nation, uh, but, you know, my, my, the tendency of my heart is uh, to uh, kind of arrogance. And as, as a Christian, am I tempted to put my trust in the kind of mighty of the world? So there, there are all these really kind of helpful and important ways that we can see that this chapter is actually uh, relevant uh, to us. Um, just a little bit of uh, further background. Uh, at, at the time that Isaiah is prophesying, uh, uh, Babylon was not yet a kind of world superpower. So this is quite uh, a bit before they, they rise to prominence. It's warning Judah in advance. And secondly, Babylon is important because uh, as much as the, the nation wasn't a superpower, the, the area kind of stretches right back to uh, Genesis and, and Babel. And so 
uh, that the nation, in a sense, embodies uh, worldly arrogance. And uh, so it's particularly um, kind of appropriate that God addresses them. Well, the first 16 uh, verses really talk about Babylon as God's agent, and it's really kind of quite confronting. Uh, they are uh, God's agent. They're, they're going to be used by God um, to, to uh, bring God's judgment. And what seems to be in view, though, is uh, not just uh, something that's going to happen in the immediate uh, history. It's um, There's a kind of end time uh, character to this chapter. So uh, things like verse four that we read, the sign of an uproar of kingdoms of nations gathering uh, together or verse uh, seven, all hands will be filled. Every human heart will will, will be melt, will melt. Sort of what God's going to do with Babylon is symbolic of what he's going to do at the end of the world. And that's why I think uh, verse 10, that kind of stars from the heavens, that language that Jesus picks up, this is uh, what, What God is going to do through Babylon is symbolic of what he's going to do uh, at the uh, end of the world. Verse 16 uh, is confronting. Uh, Their infants will be dashed to pieces before their eyes um, and uh, their houses will be plundered and their wives will be ravished. It's very, very confronting. Um, But it's worth remembering that uh, uh, Babylon, even though it's being used by God, uh, they're not acting as puppets. Here's what um, Alec Matir says in his commentary. They're being themselves to the full. Babylon, they're still being themselves. They're fully responsible. They're acting according to their own nature with their, their natural acts fulfilling his supernatural purpose. So it's not as if God's making them do these things. In God's supernatural purpose, he's using them, but they are acting um, according to their nature. And that's why 17 to 22, he holds uh, Babylon uh, to account and it speaks of uh, Babylon's uh, destruction. And uh, we saw this in uh, chapter 10. Um, Assyria was used by God, but because they weren't acting um, with God's heart, you know, they didn't have the same intention that God did, uh, God could hold them to account. And it's the same thing here. They are uh, going to be. Um, uh, they're going to be called to account. A they're going to be destroyed. Um, and um, uh, so there's, there's uh, it's interesting. Sorry. Why why are they going to be destroyed? Verse 19, we get a hint of it. Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor and pomp of the Chaldeans will be like Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, this is that they have this sense of glory and arrogance. And yet back in verse 11, I will punish punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity, I'll put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay though the pompous pride of the ruthless. Now, in the first instance, God's using Babylon to do that, but then he's going to call Babylon to account because they uh, likewise are um, uh, proud and full of their own uh, self-importance. I think it's actually a really uh, uh, important chapter. I feel like we've just get it over the surface. There are sort of lots of kind of in important theological ideas here of God using this pagan nation for his own purposes. So, uh, you know, divine sovereignty, human responsibility. So Babylon, it's not as if Babylon can say, well, you know, we were just doing what you told us to do, God. Not at all. God can hold them to account. And so some of the kind of tricky ideas that we see in, in Romans 9 to 11, you know, where God hardens people, but he still holds them to account. I think the roots of that are back here in, in, in uh, Isaiah's theology, and it helps us to understand that this pagan nation is being used for God's purposes but still held to account but the big picture for God's people is why would you trust uh, this nation Uh, they're going to come and destroy you and then they're going to be destroyed why would you trust them trust uh, the Lord and that's the message for us Uh, there will be a day of wrath we know it's going to come why trust anything other than God's salvation found in the Lord Jesus let's pray Our Father, we thank you uh, for this uh, chapter, uh, which uh, seems to be so distant from us, but shows us so clearly that you are a God who is sovereign and working all all purposes out for your uh, your ways and for the good of your people. And we pray that we would trust in your Son for your glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.